Welcome back to the channel. I hope you guys are doing great today. Um, before we get into today's video, which I'm really excited about doing for you, uh, three things. First of all, don't forget to hit the uh, sub and bell notification for your weekly updates coming to you Sunday, 4 p.m. KST. And the Instagram channel. Don't forget to get connected to the community there. I do uh, real posts and uh, upload pictures and things like that when I'm out and about doing stuff either uh, solo or with my family, like the recent trip I did uh, on the weekend. So yeah, you can check out some stuff there. Um, so that's that thing. And the second thing is... Boom! Merch store! That's right. T-shirts, sweatshirts, echo bags, and mugs all available. These t-shirts are so comfortable. Uh, all available on bonfire.com slash store slash Korea Overlander. Uh, link right here and in the description below. 100% ladies and gentlemen, 100% of all proceeds going to Child Fund Korea, a local charity. Uh, international charity, but the local chapter of that charity uh, to help out needy children here in South Korea. So what's on tap for today, ladies and gentlemen? Well, this is part two in a series talking about different vehicles, different things that we should consider when purchasing or looking for an overland or camping sort of vehicle. If you did not check out the first video, bing, I'm going to leave it up here somewhere. And that was my top five things that you should look out for when or things that you should consider when you are looking for an overland vehicle. Um, now, as far as I'm aware, as recording this video, I did not get any feedback or comments from anybody. So I'm assuming that my top five was pretty good. So yay, uh, that's good for me. I must have done my research properly. My entrance into this uh, particular topic in terms of cars, as I had mentioned in the first video, is one of enthusiasm rather than being mechanically minded, all right? I am not a mechanic. I dabble in the literalist sense of the word, and that's usually through YouTube videos. <laughs> um, because, well, I don't have a car that actually requires me to do anything because I drive an EV right now. So there's no tinkering for me to do. Um, that being said, uh, I did try my very best to use as much research as I could to make this particular uh, video available and understandable for you as a community. Um, this is not the be all end all, all right? There may be things that I miss, if that's the case. Put them down in the uh, comments below. I'd be really interested in figuring out maybe what uh, some of the things I've missed here. Um, but I am going to be dealing with the, uh, the, uh, the car love that I have right now, which is the Land Rover Discovery 4. Um, why did I choose that? Well, stay tuned to the end and I'll let you know. Uh, so there you go. Or you can just fast forward with the chapters and you can, you know, understand. Um, okay, so what I want to do is I want to look at two sides 
to this vehicle, um, the pros and cons. And I'm going to start with the cons first uh, and get those out of the way. There are two general categories of the cons with some general things kind of thrown in at the end that I'm going to talk about. All right. First thing, mechanical. No, no, no. Let's do electrical first. Uh, electrical is the first thing. Um, <clears throat> in the Discovery 3 and 4, uh, but I think it's probably more in the 3, uh, there are what we might say some electrical gremlins that exist in these vehicles. And that is primarily because this vehicle is heavily dependent on an electrical system to do a lot. The electrical system is heavy lifting. All right. Um, not only just the basics like your lights and your air conditioner and uh, the, the, you know, the power windows and doors and that sort of thing. That's, that's kind of like standard for a lot of vehicles. But this is also the suspension system. It's the terrain response system is also electrical. It's not a manual system. So you boop, flip a dial and there you go. You've got terrain response. Okay. So because all of those things work off of an electrical system, there's going to be problems. Okay. Now, um, because of this, having done some research on the, the LR forums, what I did notice was that Many people were very careful to keep an eye on their battery. And when the battery dips below a certain point, that's when the problems start happening. So a lot of the recommendations are go for a heavy duty battery. Okay. Now, depending on what area you're in, heavy duty batteries differ in price, size, etc. Heavy duty battery is what to get. It may be something that you want to have right off the bat uh, to basically, you know, change when you buy a used one, get rid of the battery altogether and get a new one. Uh, that might, in fact, solve most, at least from what I understand, a lot of those electrical gremlins. It's not always the case, of course, but it will be advantageous to you. So that's the, that's the electrical side, okay? That's the electrical side. Those gremlins do exist and it is important uh, for you to be aware of. Uh, however, I will also say that some of those electrical gremlins were covered under the early stages of warranty. And so when you do buy a used vehicle, my suspicion is, my suspicion is that most, if not all of those things will have already been fixed. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Um, okay. Mechanical side now. There's definitely a few more of these things in terms of what we need to be looking at and being aware of before purchase. First of all, this vehicle is damn heavy. It comes in at about two and a half tons. It's a tank. No doubt about it. Uh, but because of that, because of that weight, it's going to be putting pressure on certain parts of your car that are going to be probably changed more frequently than a car at a lower weight. Um, these are the tires, the anti-roll bars, the bushings, and tire rods. Those in particular on the front and the rear may have more problems because they're supported supporting a much, much heavier vehicle. Okay. Now this is going to be increased if you're doing a lot of off-road because that off-road is going to put even more strain on these parts. Okay. So that's one area to keep in mind there. Um, the second major area that includes several different parts, just like uh, the, the heaviness of the vehicle, uh, is the air suspension system as 
one entire unit, okay? And that unit is made up of essentially four different parts. Uh, it's made up of the airbags, it's made up of the compressor, it's made up of the airlines or air hoses, and the air reservoir. Now, all of those things at the same time or at different times can fail. So it's important for us to be aware that that failure may occur and also what we should do in order to uh, troubleshoot those things when they happen. Now, if you happen to be a little bit more mechanically minded, there are a ton of videos out there on kind of how to deal with uh, an air system that has dropped on one end or has dropped on all four wheels and it's bottomed out on you. Uh, there are things that you can do to mechanically assess what might be the problem and how you can extricate yourself from that problem. So, um, if, you're not, if there's literally no air in the system, it's probably the air reservoir because it can't hold anything because the system has been, the, the container itself is rusted out. If the reservoir system is okay, uh, it may be the compressor because you're turning it on, but the compressor itself is not flooding the, the system with air. That could be a problem. You could have punctures or problems with the, with the airbags that are sitting in be behind the wheels, right? That's one other problem. And it could also be you have a leak or two or many within the air hoses themselves that go from the container to the compressor to the airbags. So all of those things generally don't fail all at the same time. Okay, they generally don't fail all at the same time. But one recommendation that I did hear was if your compressor goes, change out the, the reservoir at the same time. Just it, the, the reservoir is not expensive, but do those pieces at the same time. And that way you know that if there is a problem, it's not those two things. And quite often what happens is when you change one and the other fails, you think, oh, I must have got a bad compressor because now the compressor's not working. Well, maybe not because it could just have been the reservoir. So those two pieces in tandem, take them out, put them back in. All right. Now, uh, the other thing is moving into the engine in particular. There are a few things that we need to be aware of. Some of these are not mechanical faults per se, but we do need to be aware of them. The first is if you are getting a diesel version, you need to be able to change the timing belt, usually anywhere between 100 to 120,000 uh, kilometers, uh, 80,000 miles, I guess, approximately. Um, so that's one thing, uh, 80,000 miles or eight years, 100 to 120,000 kilometers, eight years, okay, depending on which comes first. Um, that's a pretty hefty job, and, uh, but the nice thing is once you do it, you're good for another 100,000. So, you know, yeah, it's a little bit expensive, but it's going to, uh, it's going to, um, to help you. Now, if you are looking at a vehicle that is hovering around one of those 100,000 marks. So either 100,000 or 200,000. If you're getting a car that has 200,000 kilometers on it, don't worry, just be prepared that you wanna make sure that timing belt gets changed ASAP. So as soon as you buy it, take it in the shop, get your timing, your timing belts done. Okay, or the timing chain, I should say, the timing chain. Um, the belts might also need to be done. And when you do the belts, the belts are in the front of the engine, the chain is in the middle of the engine. Get all of those things changed out. And when you change the belt, also do the oil, uh, the oil filter canister thing. You get it, get it all done. Just make it, just that way you know that those parts are sound. Um, the other thing, especially, of course, with the diesel uh, version, is you're going to have uh, clogging up of the EGR valve. Uh, this is going to happen in a diesel engine. The EGR uh, valve basically takes the dirty air uh, from the diesel engine and pumps it back into the engine to burn off. That creates soot and carbon inside those valves when they get stuck up, uh, filled up and gunked up. You're going to get a... 
a warning light coming up on your dash that basically says you have low propulsion, which means you don't have enough power because of those clogs up. Now, they can be a couple of things in there. It can be, um, it can be the, the there's actually a clogging of the of the uh, filter, uh, the little monitoring system inside, in which case you can just get some uh, declogger and psh, take it out, spray it down, put it back in, see if that solves the problem. If it doesn't, then you're gonna need to have the EGR uh, valve replaced, okay? You can, when you change out, when you, when you go in and actually spray down the inside of the, the mechanism, the actual sensor, and you do that, clean out the inside of the plastic as well so that all of that carbon comes out. If that doesn't work, if it does, that's great. It just costs you only 10 bucks to do it because it's one can and it's great. If it doesn't work, it means that particular um, EGR uh, filter and uh, uh, sensor need to be replaced, okay? Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind there. Um, the other big thing that seems to be a problem, and this I think kind of falls halfway between mechanical and electrical, and that is the electric handbrake or the electric uh, parking brake. Um, these do have a tendency to go out. Uh, it is a known issue and from LR3 to LR4 has never really been fully resolved from what I understand. Uh, but what you can do is get in there and you don't have to replace it, but you can get in and have a mechanic actually take it out and re-grease it, put it back in, and that will allow the system to work uh, properly. One of the things you want to do is make sure when you're looking at an LR4 in particular, test and retest and re-retest both the parking brake to make sure there's no squelching sounds and the airbags up and down to make sure that the vehicle lifts well enough without having any problems, okay? Um, now, other negatives that are general without necessarily falling into these two categories, um, because it is a fairly big boxy tank, you're gonna have a little bit of wind noise at higher speeds. So when you're on the highway doing 100 kilometers an hour, that sort of thing, you are gonna notice that sound. Uh, it's not huge, but it is there. Um, your cornering, uh, because it is a taller vehicle and it is heavy, your cornering is, you've got anti-roll bars, but you're still going to feel it in your seat. Okay, you're still gonna feel it. Um, it's not bad, I've, I've done it. It doesn't feel that bad, doesn't, it, it's just there. Just be aware of it. That shouldn't in and of itself be a make or break for you to buy or not buy a Land Rover. Um, running costs. Running costs, uh, we have to think not only of the mechanical costs, we have to be thinking about insurance and filling your tank. Uh, running costs, oil changes, that sort of thing, those, can add up over time, so running costs uh, can be prohibitive. If you're buying one of these on a shoestring budget, as uh, High Peaks Auto said in one of his videos, don't buy this vehicle, all right? If you've got a little bit of extra money put aside and you know that these things are coming up and you can save up for them, fine, no problem. But if you're on a tight budget, LR4 is not the one for you. Um, uh, in Korea, particularly, we have to think of car inspections every two years, and we also have to think of the car tax, which is higher uh, because of the um, because of, of the size of the vehicle and the engine. The uh, engines are based. Uh, the car tax is based on the cubic inches of the engine, so. Uh, a two liter engine is going to be less in car tax than a three liter engine. Um, <clears throat> combined driving, when new, when new, you're looking at eight to 11 kilometers per liter. Um, as the car gets older, yeah, it's probably gonna go up. So be prepared for that. Um, city driving, obviously you're gonna have lower mileage and highway driving, you're gonna have more, but Keep in mind that this is a tank that you're driving and you need to be aware of those costs. Um, now, one thing I did notice in terms of the mechanical issues was that 
compared to other vehicles like the BMW X5, uh, the Audi Q6, I believe, um, these other vehicles have very similar problems. But the problem is that these issues are not really talked about that much in terms of the forums. Maybe people don't care about them as much. But for some reason, the Land, <clears throat> excuse me, the Land Rover badge has, uh, you know, people have a certain tendency to think that Land Rover is this indescribable, indestructible vehicle that won't break down. Well, it is because in comparison, other cars are doing the same thing. Okay, so what is going on in the Land Rover is equally going on in other vehicles of similar type. Okay, and that I found to be an interesting piece of information that I wanted to share with you. Okay, before I get into the pros, there's one thing that I want to talk about, and that is the IIDT tool. IID2 tool. Say that 10 times fast. Um, this tool is invaluable when you're dealing with something like this sort of a vehicle, whether it's a Land Rover, a Beamer, a, a Toyota, whatever. Get one of these things. What they do is um, when you have a fault that comes up on the screen, especially in Land Rover, because it will happen, um, it doesn't really give you a lot of information. But what you can do is you plug this mini computer, mini reader into the computer and it sends information to your cell phone via Bluetooth and it allows you to read specifically what the problem is. It gives you a lot more detail because then you can judge by reading that stuff what you need to focus on with your repairs. Okay, so that is a little bit of an expense that I would add on to the cost of the vehicle. Just automatically assume that you're going to get one. All right, you can pick them up on eBay, a used one, anywhere between two to five hundred dollars, depending on what brand it is, etc. So I would highly recommend looking looking at something like that. Um, yeah, so. Check it out. Uh, I don't have one personally because I don't need one, but I think if I was to buy something like this, that would be something I would definitely be looking at. Okay, let's transition over to the positives, okay? Because there's a lot of those too. And I've got a list. Boy, do I have a list of positives. Okay, first of all, um, there are tons of sites YouTube videos and things like that, that if you do need to get into a troubleshooting situation, you can find it, all right? The, the community is very, very good in that regard. I would particularly note a powerful UK LTD it gives you lots of how-to videos, plus they ship you stuff if you request it. You can buy stuff right from their website, it'll come to you, and you can get genuine parts. Um, the other one I would look at is uh, Atlantic British, I believe is there, or British Atlantic. I don't remember quite, but that again is similar where you can purchase uh, goods for yourself, have them come over and either you can install them yourself or have a nice friend do it for you. Um, okay, so that's one kind of general note. Specific, very capable off-road, very capable off-road. You've seen the videos, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it will come with standard with once with a center differential. Uh, you can get them with uh, rear lock, uh, rear differential lockers as well. Uh, with that, you have to go underneath the vehicle and look at the rear transmission area. And it's an added piece that's onto the transmission. It's a motor that actually goes back to your electrical problems is engaged electrically. So I'm gonna to try to put a picture here somewhere so that you know what you're looking for. Um, my recommendation, make sure you get the rear diff locker as well. Um, driving positions, when you're in the vehicle, both as a driver, front passenger, or the rear, your ability to see and the driving position is very good. You're very high off the ground, uh, it gives you a nice view all around you. The windows, the 
the windows and the uh, mirrors, the stuff about, it's all very large. And even with the vehicle so big, you really do have a nice view around you. Uh, the captain's chairs are very comfortable in the front and then in the back, you actually have a slightly raised back seat. Very, very nice. Um, the next thing I would look at is, which I think is a great benefit is the, uh, the tailgate is split from upper and lower. So you can actually do this or, and this, and you can open these, uh, separately or together. Uh, it's a great little thing and, uh, you can do something, uh, on the tailgate with the glass over top of you and it keeps you out of the rain. So yeah, excellent. <clears throat> One thing, if you're looking for an overlanding vehicle in particular, or something where you're building out something in the back, the boxy nature of the LR3, LR4, I think is second to none. Perhaps second, uh, perhaps a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon sort of thing in that boxy shape. Um, but that shape is going to provide you with a lot more space because a rounded edge is going to cut your space down. All right. So if this is, you know, here's, the, here's what you want to put in, and then this is the rounded shape that you're getting by, uh, you've lost some of that shape. Okay. So that can be uh, really, really nice there. Um, storage space. Lots of compartments, they're big, but if you roll down the two seats in the very back, that gives you seven seats, and you put down the middle three, you have 2,500 liters of space. That is massive amounts of space for storage and cargo, etc. It is really, really good. Um, the other benefit, I think, is that there are different engines to choose from, depending on what you want. There, uh, there is a th three liter TDV6, there is a three liter SDV6, and there is a three liter, uh, there's a three liter gas uh, petrol engine. There is also a five liter, but I've never seen one of those, uh, at least in this city, I've never seen one. Those are uh, V8s and they're going to they're gonna bleed you dry. So stay out of those ones. Um, the the SDV6 is uh, conditioned to provide more horsepower than the TDV6, even though they're the same engine. Okay, so keep that in mind. You will get a little bit more oomph on the throttle. Okay, I believe it's uh, 245 horsepower. Um, doesn't sound like a lot in modern vehicles, but actually stepping on the gas as I've done when I test drove it, it's not bad, actually. I mean, you're not buying it because you're running a race. You're buying it because you want a little bit of power to tow or, you know, to move the car forward. Once it gets going, it's very clippy. Um, now, the other thing that I would recommend here, which I think is a huge advantage, 2012 and above, so from 2012 to 2016, those are the that's the years you want because those models become standard, come standard with an eight-speed automatic transmission, which means it's going to increase your fuel economy at higher uh, at a higher speed when you're in seven and eight. Uh, you're out on the highway, your revs are going to go down, your engine's not going to work as hard, and you're going to save fuel. Okay, so. Uh, it makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. I, I drove the I drove the the eight speed, very smooth, very smooth. You you will you will enjoy it for sure. Okay, that's it for the pros, the cons, the middle ground, the IIDT IID2 tool, um, and hopefully that gives you a sense of what you might want to consider in terms of buying an LR4. Is this list exhaustive? No, it's not. I'm going to leave a link of all of the information that I used uh, to kind of create this list, pros and cons, in order to, uh, in order to kind of make this video and, and give you a sense of what's going on. 
All right, that's it for me. I hope it was helpful. Stay tuned for future update videos, things like the BMW uh, X1 X Drive system. I'm going to be looking at uh, Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. I'm going to be looking at uh, Jeep Cherokee, uh, maybe other vehicles coming down the pipe. So stay tuned for those. And remember, everybody, as always, live life well. Take care, everybody, and happy driving. Peace.